District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only had to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. I hope you had a lovely holiday weekend celebrating American presidents. Today, I'm going to sprinkle some newsy cultural stories, two in particular, that you should be aware of because they are conservation adjacent and they are worrisome. I'm specifically referring to two particular items, one being a policy that is being considered in New York City Council. The other is this preponderance to talk about climate anxiety. These two topics, of course, require some nuance because there isn't really nuance awarded to these type of subjects, the outright bans of different things, and also this discussion about so-called climate anxiety. And if it sounds preposterous to you, you're not alone in thinking this because anxiety is a very serious problem. Does climate induce anxiety? That's debatable. So I'm going to deconstruct these two topics for you briefly on the podcast today. Preservationist environmentalists have set out several goals for 2024, one of them being fighting forever chemicals, which we will debate here on the show throughout the year, and another being microplastics. Now, this is not me saying that microplastics aren't a serious problem or plastics pollution isn't a problem. They are very much a problem. Is the United States the greatest perpetrator of plastics pollution? In some areas, we are. But overall, there are other countries who engage in far more egregious, wasteful practices involving plastic than we do. You do a simple Google search and you see this. But New York City, when California is not the petri dish of bad environmental and general policy, New York City loves to give the Golden State, my home state, a run for its money, which is what leads me to discuss this topic. There is a potential bill called the Pods or Plastic Bill in an attempt to ban Tide Pod and also dissolvable sheets involving laundry and detergent pods. So I wrote at Independent Women's Forum on our blog, I said, New York City isn't serious about tackling crime unless it involves criminalizing the use of Tide Pods. The Big Apple, if you don't know, because this is kind of a first in the nation deal, would become the first place to ban laundry and dishwasher pods under the guise of curbing microplastics pollution. And if it were to pass, and the likelihood is very high, unfortunately, given what we know about New York, it would ban detergent pods and sheets containing the ingredient known as polyvinyl alcohol or PVA or PHOV. And if the city council passes it, it would go into effect January 2026 and result in a $400 penalty for anyone perceived to be selling or distributing this so-called contraband product in question. And succeeding penalties would be $400 for every succeeding offense. So they don't want to enforce egregious crimes. They let out criminals after they burglarize homes or restaurants or shops, after they attack people. But this is going to be more enforced than actual crime. Ridiculous. So who is pushing this? Where is this effort to ban Tide Pods and dissolving sheets coming from? Who is behind this? So doing my due diligence, as a good journalist does, I look to see that this rival company, Blue Land, which is an eco-friendly cleaning products company, is the one behind advocating for detergent pod bans. Are they to benefit financially from this directive that forcibly moves away usage from Tide Pods to natural products. And I like natural products, but I don't think a ban and the forceful adoption of such is conducive to free thought, consumer choice, and preferences. I don't like top-down directives like this. I think it actually has an opposite intended effect to discourage people from being more environmentally friendly. This is usually what happens when you institute costs, when you are forceful in making the public 
have to trade something that works and is practical for something that may not be tested, even if it gives off the appearance of being more environmentally friendly, much like electric vehicles. This is very similar to that. So Blue Land's CEO, Sarah Pajiu, said the hope is to move the market to alternatives that don't involve the plastic that is designed to go down our drains. She said, our hope is that this will be an impetus for companies broadly to innovate beyond single-use plastic and the use of single-use plastics for pods and sheets and other single-dose mechanisms. So this is not a market alternative or market action when you're calling on the city council to promote the forceful adoption or mandate of phasing out of Tide Pods for so-called alternatives. That's not the market-oriented behavior that they're speaking about. This is colluding with city council, which can be just as problematic, if not tyrannical and, and imposing as a state government or even the federal government. Local governments can unquestionably be very dictatorial sometimes or very forceful in, in mandates as well that can hurt people and also hurt the environment simultaneously. Blue Land submitted a petition to this EPA, believe it or not, asking them to remove PVA, which is polyvinyl alcohol, from its safer choice and safer chemicals ingredients list. However, even the agency said that position has no grounds in reality and they denied their petition April 2023. Alternatively, you have this group of manufacturers who make this laundry and dishwasher detergent pods known as this uh, trade association called the American Cleaning Institute comprising of Procter & Gamble, Clorox, Unilever, and Church & Dwight. They rebuked Blue Land and accuse them of engaging in misinformation about PVA's environmental footprint, stating in a statement, the innovation of water-soluble films and laundry detergent packets is a sustainability success story. They help consumers safely use, dose, douse, and store the products, making chores easier to do for everyone, including those with disabilities. They can be designed for cold water wash cycles, reducing the footprint associated with heating water, end quote. They also hit back Blue Land's argument that PVA, PHOV, Pods and dissolving sheets exacerbate microplastic pollution, stating it dissolves entirely when in contact with water and is biodegradable in nature. If we're talking about science, Michigan State University has kind of a primer on PVA, and they call PVA fairly safe to use and describe it as a water-soluble synthetic polymer with various applications from glue to medications to food packaging to pods. And I go on to write PVA or PHOV, safe for consumption and ingestion. You don't want to ingest Tide Pods. We saw that trend a few years ago. That's stupid. Is generally safe for humans to use for cleaning purposes, for instance. And additional research on PVA or polyvinyl alcohol suggests that the ingredient is non-toxic, biocompatible, biodegradable, and widely available. And like I said a little earlier, plastic pollution, including that of microplastics, is a serious problem around the globe. But if New York triggers this ban... How are you going to make up for the difference in reliance on this product, which it's debatable whether or not it actually is contributing to microplastics pollution, as we're discussing now? There, there's a debate to be had here, and even the EPA said it's safe and workable to use in everyday chores and cleaning functions, etc. Are Americans going to give up Tide Pod use? 20 billion Tide Pods are used annually by Americans because it is largely seen as effective clean, gets the job done when you're doing laundry and washing dishes. I don't see people forcibly trading these Tide Pods for Blue Land products in particular. And if it were to be, let's say, a true market orientation towards, let's say, Tide Pod alternatives, why does Blue Land have to benefit? What are they going to receive and benefit financially? They're trying to rig the market in their favor with complicity from local NYC government So they're engaging in cronyism and they're trying to tilt the scales in their favor, which is cronyism, not free enterprise. But on the question of microplastics pollution, I want to point your interest to this article in Pew Trust. They write in March of 2021, microplastics are a big and growing part of global pollution, but existing solutions, if widely implemented, could significantly reduce the problem by 2024. And so what are microplastics? I should have also talked about this. There is no standard definition of microplastics, according to Pew Trust. They are commonly defined as plastic particles smaller than 5 millimeters, about the diameter of a standard pencil eraser. Pew Trust also says they're pretty ubiquitous in terms of being found widely in the environment from high up Mount Everest to the deep sea and even in humans and other animals. 
And they write, of course, preventing such tiny particles from entering the environment is a huge challenge because they are not uniform in shape, size, or type of plastic. Understanding how different types of microplastics are generated and become pollution requires information on their production and use, how frequently they are formed from larger plastics, and on where they are found in the environment once they are released. So even proponents of combating microplastic pollution have said it's really hard to quantify and identify what microplastics are. So quick recap here. The EPA says that polyvinyl alcohol is safe to use. Um, There's debate over whether or not the alternatives to Tide Pods are more effective and perhaps environmentally workable. And do people want to be mandated to use a particular product when they should have the choice on their own volition to pick and choose the product that is best for them and their needs for laundry and dishwashing? I don't see New Yorkers receiving this policy prescription well, and I think debate still needs to be had over this. And yes, there is a inclination to use natural products. I prefer to use natural products myself for cleaning needs, but I still use some Tide Pods when I have to. And I think consumers, New Yorkers in this case, should be left to choose what is best for them and assess, do you want to have a more expensive product that may be favored by this type of policy, or do you want the market to determine who the true winners and losers are. I'm going to err towards the latter. I hope you do too. Let's talk about climate anxiety because I keep seeing headlines discussing this, inviting and inflaming more tensions on this subject. And it's very worrying to me to see people younger than me. I'm a millennial. I see Gen Zers and even some fellow millennials subscribing to this or or buying into this notion that they're suffering from climate anxiety because of headlines that are being readily available and out there on media, TV, social media, digital means, what have you. And we have climate alarmists and climate activists larger to blame for this inducing of climate anxiety. I want to bring your attention to this one article that just came out from Bloomberg Green. And I like subscribing to Bloomberg Green. I think they actually have great coverage, but they do peddle in a lot of nonsense, much like this climate anxiety notion. So they have a headline under their greener living section called climate change is fueling a new type of anxiety therapists say. I've been seeing this reference to climate anxiety for several years. The National Institutes of Health is writing about this. They have a study from August 2021, the psychology of climate anxiety. If you want to go down a rabbit hole and read how crazy this is, I defer you to do that. You can find this in the show notes. But this is not a new topic. This has been talked about and forced into the conversation about energy environment conservation for several years. So this is not a new phenomenon, but they keep harping on this. And this is where I get extremely concerned. And you don't need to be a psychologist to call this out and question the science here. But now if you question anything, you may be labeled a heretic. I have to wonder where are the psychologists who are opposed to this? I know they exist because they can't all be going along with this notion of climate anxiety and perpetuating this and and feeding into more fears and, and this unhealthy behavior that a lot of these young people are feeling. So where are they? I hope they start speaking out against this. But the article talks about climate anxiety and talks about, enlists this person, psychotherapist Caroline Hickman. She says that we don't 100% know how to deal with it. And it would be a huge mistake to try and treat it like other anxieties that we are familiar with that have been around for decades. This one is much, much worse. And people wonder why this is worse, because it's omnipresent, it's everywhere. They have to look in the mirror. The article goes on to say, in most critical cases, climate anxiety disrupts the ability to function day to day. As someone who cares deeply about the environment, if I paid attention to every single headline, I would go nuts. And I look through each of these headlines and I realize a lot of them are unfounded and alarmist in nature, so I don't let it phase me. You have to exert self-control, and I'm worried that a lot of these young kids who've been indoctrinated to an extent and been told that you are going to be adversely affected by a changing climate or warming or cooling, biodiversity loss, habitat destruction. No conservationist is crying over problems. If they find something to be problematic, they're trying to find solutions. They're not crying over headlines and going to psychotherapists for help. This Bloomberg article continues like this. In most critical cases, climate anxiety disrupts the ability to function day to day. Children and young people in this category feel alienation from family and friends, distress when they, when thinking about the future and intrusive thoughts about who will survive, according to Hickman's research. 
Patients obsessively check for extreme weather, read climate change studies, and pursue radical activism. Some devastatingly consider suicide as the only option. And Hickman isn't the only expert seeing this. Another person who wrote this book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, named Sarah Gray, describes a student who has such severe self-loathing eco-guilt that she stopped consuming much at all, including food. So we're to believe that people who question if there is a climate crisis are the ones fueling so-called climate anxiety. No, it's the people who are propagating a lot of this climate activism who are the ones who are inculcating these young impressionable minds with fear mongering, with doubt, with self-loathing, fear about their surroundings, fear about eating meat, fear about living a first world luxury, you know, fossil fuel dependent lifestyle. One of the biggest propagators of climate anxiety, if we're being honest, are certain lawmakers, particularly alarmists like Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. He has a tweet regarding this article, our gift to younger generations. 59% of children and young people are very or extremely worried about climate change, according to the survey of 10,000 respondents across 10 countries in 2021. Nice work, boomers. He's a boomer, right? He's pushing this narrative and pushing these headlines He's also making people feel guilty about their fossil fuel usage. And he's unsurprisingly an eco-hypocrite himself. That's usually how these people are. But when you have people like a senator from Rhode Island, in this case, Sheldon Whitehouse, saying that, oh, boomers are to blame for climate anxiety. No, it's people like him who are making young people fearful about their surroundings, about the environment. You have academia harping on this. You have media harping on this, pushing these headlines unquestionably like they're sound and that everyone agrees and there's consensus over this. There's no consensus over this. You have culture pushing this alarmist narrative too, that everything is ruined. You can't salvage the environment. It's such a horrible time. But I hate to break it to these climate alarmists who are fueling this anxiety over the climate. We are so much better off in the environment today than we were maybe 50 years ago because of modern advances better quality of life, better environmental standards, largely because of the free market, not because of top-down solutions, and just people being more naturally conscious about their surroundings. We are in such better shape, environmentally speaking, conservation-wise. There's so much positive out there. We have fewer people dying from climate-related disasters. It is down 96% from, let's say, the previous century or so. We have more wildlife on the landscape because of hunters and anglers. We have better quality of air and water because people are now privy to care about this stuff. But this is a way for climate alarmists like Sheldon Whitehouse and others to make money and to stoke fear and paint a inaccurate picture of our environmental state. And this is in large part to continue to fuel this push for net zero, for decarbonization. People are not going to get rid of carbon. People are not going to get rid of carbon intensive goods and services Are you really wanting to trade your first world living standards for third world? I don't think so. I think more people are going to see through net zero and this alarmist rhetoric, and I'm encouraged. However, the fact that this type of alarmist rhetoric is still being encouraged yet unchallenged is abominable. That's why here on the podcast, even though we trounce these crazy trends or talk about bad policy. I also like to couple that and contrast that rather with good things, good advancements, people who are actually shaping the environment positively, not these grifters and these alarmists who are painting a inaccurate picture of the state of the environment, especially here in America today, because they have an agenda. They don't care about the environment. These people, Sheldon Whitehouse could care less about the environment. He's all about net zero and solar and wind. Where is his outrage over millions of acres potentially going to be bulldozed to make room for solar farms out west crickets he doesn't care about the scaling up of offshore wind potentially impacting marine life on the atlantic coast he could care less he's all on board that so he's a hypocrite all these people are hypocrites and they're the ones who are inducing anxiety about climate and the environment onto people and they should be called out because this is unacceptable that this is happening Parents have to be, if you have kids, you have to be active in your children's upbringing. My parents were active with me. I have friends who have kids. I have nieces and nephews whose parents are very active. You cannot let bureaucrats and alarmist politicians stoke fears in your children because it's going to have adverse effects. We see reports about how Gen Z and all these other younger Americans coming up 
have so much anxiety over things they can't control or over things that are not as bad or problematic as believed to be. These psychoanalysts, these psychotherapists, these politicians, these alarmists are the ones who should be blamed for inducing climate anxiety or anxiety about the climate, rather. These people need to look in the mirror because they're the ones who are pushing this and propagating this onto the masses. Going out to nature should be a sense of relief. You should be feeling a lot more at peace and a lot more at ease when you're in green spaces or by water. But they don't want you going out to nature. They want you fretting over the climate. They want you fretting over the environment. And they don't care about your well-being. So I hold these people responsible and I will call them out happily because these misinformers are also telling us that hunters and anglers are the greatest despoilers of the environment. That's all I have to say about climate anxiety. Let me know your thoughts. I would love to hear your feedback. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go leave us some reviews on Apple and Spotify or wherever podcasts are played. Your feedback will help us reach more people. And I love to know what is on your mind after each episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat or a guest announcement because that is our way of updating all of you listeners. And we have just hit a thousand followers on Instagram for the podcast account. Thank you very much. And if you have any guest suggestions or topics you want to hear on the show, I'm all ears. I would love to hear your feedback there. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.